chapter? On so this is chapter 15, uh, CFA 10. Um, so for part A, you're trying to find the two-year implied forward rate uh, for a deferred loan beginning in three years. So what you do is you take uh, one plus the spot interest or spot rate of interest for year five, add it to one, and then to the power of five divided by one plus the spot rate of interest for year three to the power of three minus one, you do all the calculations, comes out to 6.07%. Then for part B, you're trying to compute the price of a five-year annual pay treasury security with a coupon rate of 9%. Um, and then here you're assuming the par value of $1,000. So for each year, you do 90 divided by 1 plus the spot, in, spot rate of interest to the power of the year. And then the last, for the last year, you do par value plus the 90. So it'd be $1,000 and 90, or 1,090 divided by 1 plus the spot rate of interest for year five. Do all the calculations, you get $987.10. Yeah, make sure that when you... Uh that you put up the assumptions okay. next time, like with, with the term of maturity and the spot rate of interest rate. Okay. Okay. All right, so here we have uh, chapter 16, number three, and here are the givens listed out. So it's a nine year bond, 10% yield, and the duration is uh, 7.194 years. Um, the objective is if the market yield changes, 50 basis points, what is the percent change in the bond price? Um, so the equation is negative D over 1 plus Y times the change in Y, which then gives you um, negative 7.194 over 1.1 times 0 0.005, and then that gives you a decline of 3.27%. Okay. And, and if you get a decline <coughs> in it, uh, what would you uh, do if you had derivatives? How would you hedge off the decline? How would you hedge off the, the test question? How would you hedge off the, the decline in the in the price? Or let's say this is the value. You're, you're doing this on a portfolio basis. <coughs> and you're calculating um, what the... Uh, uh, interest rate sensitivity is going to be on your bond portfolio. Okay, so the uh, interest rates go up and the, the, the values go down. How would you hedge off that risk on the bond portfolio? How would you head, hedge off interest rate risk on a bond portfolio using derivatives? Would you like the stock? If it's going no, down, hold on. Would, you go, would you go short on it and then? Well, if, it's, if it, interest rates are going up, the value of your bond portfolio yeah. is going down. So you go okay, down. and this calculates the uh, rate of decline in your bond yeah. portfolio based right. on the du duration. Right. So if you're forecasting that the value of your bond portfolio going is going to go down, what would be your derivative trades? Like just all of them? Yeah, how would, how would you hedge on? Right forwards, right the futures, right calls on futures, buy puts on futures. Exactly, on right. the indexes. Sell short, yeah. Yep, that's it. No, nope. these are just bonds. You don't just sell short bonds. Yeah. And there's no uh, puts and calls. It's all based on the index. So it's just right forwards, right futures. Right, calls on futures and my puts on futures, okay. exactly. Yeah. And we'll get into that later, too. Okay, who's got 15.5? Uh, so All right. Um, so the tables below show, respectively, the characteristics of the two Did angle. you put the tables up? Yeah. Okay, yeah, don't stand in front of us. Okay, perfect. So uh, turn will pay bonds from the same issuer with the same... Uh, priority in the event of default in spot interest rates. Neither bond's price is consistent with the spot rates. Using the information in these tables recommended, either bond A or a bond B for purchase. So these are the characteristics. So we're going to grow them out in the spot rates of 5, 8, and 11. So as you see, bond A, we have 10%. So we're going to go spot rate 5, 8, 11, bond B, 6, so 6, 5, 8, 11. We grow them out. We get 98.53, which is 13 cents more. We get 88.36, which is two, yeah, two cents less. Um, and then, so bond A sells for 13 cents of less, uh, less than the present value of its strip payments. Bond B sells for 0 0.02 less than the present value of the strip payments. Bond A is uh, more priced more attractively. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, so this is chapter 15.
16, uh, the fixed income, income securities uh, number eight. Um, and so it's based off number seven, but the price, uh, just talking about bonds, and the price at the end of um, maturity four years was 7.16. So plugging that in, um, or sorry. So the problem is finding the rate of return um, of the bond each year, and then showing that that equals the forward rate for each year from problem seven. And so the forward rates um, from problem seven were 5%, 6%, 7%. <coughs> Um, but using those um, at the start of each year, uh, discounting the base bond price um, with the forward rates, I can turn uh, said expected price numbers, um, 792.16, 839.69, 881.68, and 934.58. And so calculating the expected rate of returns with those numbers, you get 6%, 5%. 6% and 7% at year 4. Okay, is that it? Okay. Okay, then you're on. Alrighty. So, apologies. I didn't realize how it's formatted. So, this is A. This is B, C is here. Um, so the problem is, is that we need to basically figure out U.S. Treasury bonds. So what we're going to do in part A, or usually this Treasury note yield curve data. So we have to figure out the years, years of maturity. We have one, two, three, four, and five, with our coupon rates of five, five point two, six, seven, six, seven, and seven. And then we need to calculate the spot rates and the forward rates. So off of that. Uh, we have, we were given the spot rates of 5, 5.216, 05, and this, and 7.16. And you see the numbers here for the calculate the forward. I forgot a number. Um, we need to find out what the fifth year spot rate and what the fifth year calculated forward rate is. So if we look at part A, our five-year spot rate is going to be the $1,000 with the equals to 70 over 1 plus the year 1 raised to that power. And you're going to do that all the way down the line until year 5 where you have 1,000 plus 70 plus your 1 plus the year 5 raised to the fifth. Um, just bring that down. You plug in 1.05, which is based off of the... Uh, coupon rate here, this should have a 1 to the first power, and you go down the line, you go all the way up to year 4, plugging in the coupon rates, no, excuse me, spot rates, all the way up to year 4, and since we do not have year 5, you come down, you figure out what these are, and you get those, and you still have the 1,070, which we still do not know. To figure out what the 1 plus y subscript 5 to the 5th is, you take the 1,070 and you put it over $758.32, not sure where that came from, to be honest, but, um, which will give you a yield of 7.13% after you do y to the 5th equals uh, 1.411 to squared, or not squared, take the square root of that to the fifth power, minus one. Um, and in order to calculate the five-year forward rate, you're going to take that 7.13%, add one to it, raise it to the fifth, over the fourth year from here, divide it, minus it by one, to get 7.01%. That is going to be our five-year forward rate here. And then to calculate our PV, it's going to be the $1,000 over the 1.0716 raised to the fourth, which gives you a PV of $758.35. That's where you get it over there. Oh, okay. So you have to calculate this before you can yeah. calculate this. Yeah. Got it. That's it. And then uh, make sure you sign that and give it to me. Uh, chapter 15, problem number 14 is. Uh, you're looking at uh, zero coupon bonds and trying to figure out that. 
Uh, if the bond structures stay the same, these are the uh, unit maturity, which means the, the percents that you get. If you go into the following year and the structures are the same, will they uh, want to uh, invest into a one year or a four year bond? And uh, because it's the one year, you know that your uh, rate of return is going to be 6.1%. And so you look at the four year zero uh, coupon bond today. Figure out how much it's worth, 1,000 divided by the 1.064 to the fourth. Uh, you get 780.25. And then the four year next year is based, is now a three year zero coupon bond yield to maturity. So instead of using the 1.064, use the 1.063. Raise it to the third power. Uh, gives you what it's worth. The price difference is 6.7%, and because that's greater than the 6.1, You'd rather invest into the four-year bond for a higher one-year uh, return rather than the one-year. Okay. It looks like James. So this is uh, chapter 16, uh, number 9, Managing Bond Portfolios. So an insurance company has to um, cover a customer of uh, 10 million in one year and then 4 million in five years, and the yield curve is flat at 10%. And to fund these obligations with a single issue of a zero bond, coupon bond, um, we're trying to figure out what maturity bond uh, must have purchased. And so we made this chart here where it has uh, the time to fill. We have one and then the five. So the five we do uh, Four million. So um, in the first, we have uh, ten million, and we divide it by one point one. Um, so, so we can find the PV of the cash flow with the discount of that ten percent. So it would be that. And then this four million, we do the same thing, divided by one point one, but we put it to the fifth power. And with that, we got two point four eight. And with those weightings, we got that together, and we got the weights times the amount of time it takes to fill. And we found our um, re required maturity of the zero coupon bond, which is 1.8, uh, 1.85. And so... Yeah, that's the duration. Uh, the duration? Yeah. The, the duration is 1.8, uh, 5.72. Okay, so the duration is 1. Point, uh, which, which is the required maturity. Okay, got it, the required maturity. Um, and then, um, so... The next question would be, uh, what is the mark, or, uh, the base and market value of the zero coupon bond? And so, uh, eleven point five seven uh, is the same as the market value for the obligations that we have. So, therefore, the face value must be that eleven point five seven times one point one, uh, with the mat uh, required maturity at the power, we get thirteen point eight. Okay. Yeah. And then Ivan's uh, finishing his up. Um, that Dakota, can you uh, can you plug your uh, spreadsheet in and walk us through how you uh, uh, took the original uh, static spreadsheet worksheet that I provided you and you put in the uh, the dynamic weights using the optimization approach? Did you do the target yet? Uh, I have not. Okay. Uh, I set it up. You're still working out what it is, what's what it's going to finally be. Yeah, but I have a link to where. Yeah. But you're still working out. Yeah. Now, Dakota's going to walk us through. He already uh, <clears throat> ran the uh, quadratic optimization, the uh, dynamic approach, and put it into the uh, static portfolio to be able to do the back test. <clears throat> and when you walk us through that, can you give me what your uh, 135 rates of return were on the static and the active? 
in the um, in the uh, the alphas. You didn't go back ten years, did you? No, but. So um, this is how I found our, uh, or this is how I plug in our active uh, percentages from the uh, optimization into the passive portfolio uh, to make it our active portfolio. So what I did is after you ran the uh, iterations and found the uh, highest sharp number, I took those percentages, copied and pasted them into my uh, so what I did is I took the passive portfolio and made another copy of it, relabeled it to make it an active portfolio. What I did is I took our total. What we did is we used sales to weight um, all of our stocks. So I took this seven point seven six or seven seventy six point nine one, uh, put it into another sheet, and then what I did was all these right here are the copied over weights from the portfolio optimization. Uh, once you multiply them over, it gives you uh, this set of numbers. And what those are is if you plug those numbers in the blue back into our total sales, what it does is it kicks out the same weights that we have from our active portfolio. Um, and then making another copy of that, to make our hybrid, what I did was did the same thing where this is our 776.91 again. These are our active weights in the blue, and this is our current active sales prices. But because we, uh, we're probably going to want to have like a 1% at least, the minimum for every single stock, we, what I did was I linked all of these. Um, percentages to where when I change these percentages, for example, if I make this if I make that 1% oh, then when I go to, it gives me the 7.67 as my sales, when I go to my total sales it will pop it out right here and so then what you can do is you can then start messing with the weights on this sheet and then compare them to the back test one year, three year, and five year and see how they turn out. Uh, for our passive, we had a 20.1% one year return. Okay, hold on. So on new, this is your static? Yeah. So what did you, let's do the forward, uh, forward test first. The front test, what the difference so far this year? Oh yeah, well we don't have the new prices. Okay, so let's just do the one year then. So what did you, what was your return in the alpha? Uh, 20.1 as the return, and our alpha was 466. Okay, and then give me the uh, three year. Uh, 10.6 and 232. Okay, then give me the uh, five year. It was 11.8 and uh, negative 27. And then negative 27. And then give me your dynamic portfolio performance. So the one year return on the dynamic Nineteen. And then what was your alpha? Four fifty-five. Okay. And then give me your three-year. Seventeen. And eight seventy-six. Uh, hold on. Got it. Okay. And the five years fifteen point five. What was your portfolio style? What was the uh, composition of your portfolio? Um, is it tech? Uh, large cap tech and healthcare with small cap energy. Large cap tech? Tech and healthcare okay. with small cap energy. So here basically, uh, 
here's what here's what we got right here. This is from Dakotas. Okay, and this is kind of what I would be looking for in the middle of your uh, your report or even your uh, uh, your memo because this is all we really care about, right? Um, and ideally, would be some kind of data uh, would be probably important to uh, to see. But his static portfolio over the last year did 20%. Over the last three years did 10.6, and over the last five years did 11.8 per year. Uh, he had a 466 alpha basis point alpha on the one year, 232 on the uh, three year, and then did you say negative 27 on the, yeah. on the five year? If you ran the 10 year, it'd probably be better. It'd probably be positive again, yeah. because you're probably capturing some kind of cyclical based on yeah. your concentration here. So that's you, what we said is in our memo, we, we're probably just going to write like a little Yeah, you might want to run the 10. For it. You might want to run the 10. Just to, I mean, you want to sell it, you want to sell this, right? Yeah. So it's going to be kind of hard to sell it to the pension funds, you know, on a five year hold on this uh, one. So if you have a 10 year hold, then you can beat the S&P 500 yeah. with some kind of alpha, then we're going to get the money. Well, the other thing we talked about is that that's our static, and then like mixing it. Oh, that's true. So we want to, our hybrid will take that out. That's probably right. Yeah. It's probably going to be someplace in the middle. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's what you're selling. Yeah. Is the target. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, is everybody, do you understand what we're doing here? You know, and then what he's, he's going to do is he's going to set it up. What was your vision of the, uh, the company table? So you have the target in the middle, you got the st static weights, and you got the active weights. Yeah. And then were you going to stick a couple more rows? I was saying to like put, put that below it. I was saying to put that below it. With this table below yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, so you would lead with the target portfolio, compare was, it against the... The target portfolio in the middle. Yeah, so you start with the portfolio compositions. Yeah, like how we did the... Uh, when we did the weighted valuations for perpetuity, bone growth, and all that. Yeah, and yeah. We had our target in the middle and everything else on the outside. Exactly. Okay, and then you'd have this next. Yeah. So you're answering the question, what is the target composition of the portfolio compared to the static and the active? And then you're going to hit me with the performance. Yep. And then what I would do is probably put the performance back up in the thesis statement, right? Because you're selling us the target. Right? And then the rest of it's what? Do we care about a lot of the other stuff? We're just writing stuff. The rest mm -hmm. of it becomes almost appendix. Yeah. Right? Okay, is everybody clear? It's just the validation. The rest of the is the validation. Yeah, the, the, that was the most important thing, right? And then you're going to have, uh, again, you're going to probably, you're going to, I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't have the, the table of the target with the static next to the active in the memo. That's all we care about is this, in the memo. Okay. And I would just do the target in the memo. This would be in the document. It could be later on. That's all we care about is the target portfolio performance. Okay. Okay. All right, is everybody clear? So you're saying we're not putting that in the memo that say, we submit? I would not, it's just too much. Yeah. So I would just use the target. Oh, you're saying? I would just use the target benchmarking, because that's all we care about, yeah. is, the, uh, is the rate of return in the, uh, in the alpha on the target with the, uh, with the data, right, compared yeah. to the market. And then you put this in the report right up front. Mm -hmm. Under portfolio performance is going to be the first section of the report. Because this is what we care about. Most of the rest of it's going to be how did, how did you do the static, how did you do the active, how did you come up with the, the target. Does that make sense? So you bring all the important stuff up front, and then you stick all the data analysis and analysis stuff in the back. Because if, if, you're, if you're talking too much about the, uh, the details up front, you're wasting my time. Okay, did anybody else have anything? I've been the two. Were you ready to go? Jock, were you able to, to do this one? Or no, I'm sorry, I've been doing that. Can, can you do that one? Yeah, sure. I don't think it's going to take you. The solder? Yes, so I'm going to add them. Are you going to do yours today? Oh, you got time? You got like, uh, you got 15 minutes.
and Jock's hooked on the, on the memo. Okay, you guys are on. No, uh, Ivan's on, but you guys are actually on. Okay, James. Okay, Ivan, give it to us. So for part A, the question is, what do you expect the rate of return to be over the coming year on a three-year coupon bond? So, uh, a three-year zero coupon bond with a uh, face value of $1 will sell today at a yield of uh, 6% and a uh, price of, uh, price of uh, so we divided our, value, our face value of $1 over 1 plus uh, the yield to maturity, which is 0 0.6 uh, to so we got 88.96. We did the same for a second year maturity. We got 88.9. Right? And uh, for part B, the question is under the expectation hypothesis, what yield to maturity does the market expect to observe on a one and two year zero zeros at the end of the year? Uh, is the market expectation of the return of the three year bond? Greater or less than ours. Yeah, so the 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 four the four rate be divided the succeeding um, rate over the the past the current the current rate minus one and got six point zero one. We did the same thing for year three. And I got eight point zero three. Uh, lower price and a uh, higher rate of turn. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, do it on Friday. Yeah, just come. come.